joining us. Uh, the pollster, Philip Gould, was one of the key architects of New Labour. He was recruited in the 1980s by Peter Mandelson and he brought in new ideas, most notably focus groups asking members of the public detailed questions about politics to broaden the Labour Party's appeal. Behind the scenes, he was crucial to Tony Blair's three election victories. Well, he's just published an updated version of his book, The Unfinished Revolution, which is an analysis of New Labour, which has long been required reading for ambitious politicians of all parties. But the past three years have been dominated by a very different battle against cancer of the esophagus. Despite gruelling treatment, that cancer has recurred, and he now knows that he will not recover. I met Philip Gould at his home. I hope you'll agree that what follows is a remarkable and rather unusual interview for a political programme like this. But first, I asked him about Tony Blair's leadership style. He says it was like driving down the centre of the road very fast, pushing everything else to one side. But where, I asked, did they really know where they, were, where they wanted to go? Tony did believe that values and an explicit sense of purpose should be kept, mm. for the most part, quiet. He really did have a church and state thing on this. He really thought his private spiritual life was over here and his public uh, pragmatic life was over there. And so that meant that much of his rhetoric, much of his argument, much of his narrative was focused on the pragmatic rather than on the... Um, what's it all for? What's it all for, yes. Now, um, it is one of the big claims of my book, I think, that this was a failure. I do think that leadership depends on purpose. I think that individuals depend on purpose. I think politics depend on purpose. I think that in this world, which is so chaotic and so disordered, without purpose, you are lost. It's an essential part of leadership now. And uh, I don't think he, he did that absolutely perfectly. In your diaries, there's the accounts of the, the arguments, the now famous endless arguments yeah. between Gordon Brown and, and Tony Blair, um, go on and on and on, and uh, were clearly so destructive of energy and purpose and so on. Yes. Was that just an inevitable clash of two very, very different personalities, two different worldviews that was never going to be harmoniously reconciled? I think that what happened there was this, that Gordon did believe uh, that he would come to be leader of the Labour Party <clears throat> and that the, the supporters around him, I suppose, believed that even more. They were so close. So close working together. You know, you'd go into their office and, you know, you'd, you'd be met by a kind of, sort of kind of a, a, a wall of energy, yeah. you know, piling towards you and they'd both be on their kind of computers, they'd both be, there'd be papers everywhere, bits of sock, bits of this everywhere. It was a completely chaotic mm. sense, but a sense of huge, huge energy. And Tony and Gordon were just remarkable in those, mm. those days. It was, it was incredible. And, and they were close, too. Um, increasingly close, I think. Um, and so they were almost one person. Certainly felt like brothers to me. And yet there would be only one person. And as it went on, Increasingly, it was going to be Tony. I knew it would be Tony. Others knew it would be Tony. But it's hard to tell Gordon because you know, he, he, he is, on the one hand, a very tough individual, but a very vulnerable in individual too. And it just was too much for him. And it grew from there. Can we turn to talk about your cancer? Yeah. And how that, um, in many ways, meshes with the, the politics that you've been describing? Um, because you had, um, you've had three major recurrences. But right at the beginning, um, you chose to go private in, uh, in America. And I think later on you came to think that actually the NHS might have been a better choice. Yes. That's so. I talked to a lot of people in the NHS and they, they said, well, look, you know, if the best place to go is um, Murray Brebner at Sloan Kettering. In New York. Yes. Yeah. And this, the, the level of quality was good. But then, uh, about a year or two years later, it clearly had for 
re returned. So you go up to Newcastle and you are confronted or you meet um, this, this excellent surgeon yeah. um, who, as it happened, been at school with Tony Blair. Yes. Um, but was vehemently pro-NHS. Yes, yes. Not very keen on Southerners. No, he was, he not was, very keen he, on private no, His position health. was basically anti-Southerner, anti-private, anti-New Labour. But the quality of nursing there, the quality of care, the quality of the uh, surgery was outstanding. So uh, in, in the end, the NHS had the best place, not, yes. not the United States. No, here no the NHS that. had the best place here, for sure. And so where are you now in terms of... No, where, where we are now is this, that we went on holiday with, with Gail. And this was such an important moment for her. She was sort of packing her stuff weeks in advance. It was so important that we went on holiday uh, for once. And then we'd, have, we'd, we'd go to sort of have lunch and Gail would be saying, eat more, eat more, eat more, eat more, because she knew I was thinning. Mm. And I was eating it, but I saw my weight going down. Mm. And if your weight goes down, you're eating, it's problematic. And I had one or two other symptoms too. So I came back, um, called the Marsden up, went in for a blood test, and they phoned up and said, your blood tumour mark has actually gone up from 5% two or three weeks ago to 58%. And at that point, that's it. I knew that was it. I phoned Gail up and she said, that's it. And so we knew. Then they called us in and they said, well, look, you know, you've got... It's in the lymph nodes here. It's in the lymph nodes there. It's going to continue and you're never going to get, cl get clear of this now. And um, I said, how long to live? And uh, Dr. Cumming, I'm sorry, Professor Cumming said, three months. And then Gail said, the worst case was three months. And, and Gail said, what's the best case? And he said, three months. Yeah. This time, it was clear. I was, you know, I was in a different place, a death zone, where there was such an intensity, such a power and and apparently this is normal and so even though obviously I'd rather not be in this position it is the most extraordinary time of my life certainly the most important time of my life. You said an extraordinary thing um, before about this which is being in the death zone you're you would not have chosen this but you wouldn't want to walk away from no, it and no. you wouldn't have wanted to die as the person that you were before the recurrence no, of cancer. No, no. That, that was certainly true in the uh, it's certainly true that after the first recurrence, I would not wish to have died the person I was. But when you get to the final stage, the death zone, you are dealing with something which is so intense. I mean, I look out of the window and I feel the intensity, the intensity of my wife, the intensity of my family, that it is the, the natural place to be. And to leave this now, to leave this extraordinary place now, uh, I would not want to do that. This is, mm. this is the final place and the right place for me at this time is to be in the final place. Can I ask you one other question yes. about that, which is um, something that uh, your wife Gail said to you, that politics, being involved in politics, was somehow connected to your cancer, that the, the, the nastiness of politics and the aggression of politics had somehow contributed to your cancer. Yes, I think that's true. What would have been better for me would have been to have said, I'll do what I can do, which I do quite well, and then just push it back a little bit. And, of course, the other side of it is that it's only because I'm an obsessive nutcase when it comes to politics that I've done what I've done. What would you say um, as, a, as it were, a sort of testamental thought to um, Ed Miliband and the Labour Party as it is now. I think at one and the same time, he has to have a, a strategy that deals with the hard end of it. I mean, he really does have to nail down the economy, and I'm sure he will and make sure we are the party of the economy. He has to nail down responsibility and make us 
the party of the, responsi uh, 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 of the responsible electorate. And I think he has to uh, be tough in the way that he deals with some of these issues. And I think that is the combination that wins the election. And it would be a good thing for Labour if his brother was able to be alongside him in this well, journey. Well, I, I would very much like that. And I think what better epitaph for the whole book, really, is a book that starts with the angularity and the difficulty with the relationship between two almost brothers, ending in, I hope, friendship between two real brothers. And I think that, that may well happen. And I, look, I lived under, I was born under a Labour government. And uh, I am determined to die under a Labour government. Obviously, I have to get a move on, but I, <laughs> that, 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 that is what I want to happen. But I suppose my message is, have faith. And try and change the world.